I'd now like to introduce Lauren Anderson. Now, we heard earlier, earlier from Tom about overconsumption. But what is the future for consumption? Because what models of consumption can, can sustain us? Collaborative consumption is, is a term which is uh, up and rising, we're hearing more often about. So please welcome an expert in this field, Lauren Anderson.
So hands up in the room who has a power drill or whose mum or dad has a power drill. And how many of you plan to use that this week? Or next week, or the week after, or the week after. <laughs> Basically, the average power drill, awesome for those of you who are drinking DIY, right? but for those who have a power drill, it's basically used between 12 to 17 minutes in its entire lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and as Rachel famously said in her TED speech a couple of years ago, what we want is the whole, not the drill. So this is a massive revelation in the way we're thinking about the stuff that we own. So instead of actually buying that drill, why don't you borrow one off the newly launched Australian site Open Shed, which exposes the sheds and garages and spare rooms of people all around the country who are prepared to rent out the stuff that they do have. Or in fact, you might be able to make $15 a day or $20 a day on your own drill, which is otherwise gathering dust and that you would like to see put to good use. Or for everyone who's going to university next year, perhaps instead of forking out hundreds of dollars on textbooks, you might actually be able to consider renting all of your textbooks instead through a website called Zucal, which allows you to save almost $500 a year on textbooks that go out of date as soon as you finish the semester and you can't actually then on sell them. So this is a major change in, in liberating the way we think about the stuff that we need to access. And what it points to is the fact that our relationship with the stuff we have is becoming less and less material. And we don't want the, the CDs, we want the music. We don't want the DVD, we just want to watch the movie. We don't want the clunky physical stuff, but we want access to the information or the knowledge that it holds. We don't want stuff, but we want the needs or experiences it fills. And that leads to the fact that access, in this instance, is actually better than ownership, which is the fundamental principle, principle underlying collaborative consumption. So the second system of collaborative consumption we call redistribution markets, which is a very simple concept and one that has existed for a long time, taking something from where it's not wanted and shifting it to someone or somewhere where it's needed. But prior to technology, this would have been like putting a notice board, uh, a sign on a notice board and hoping that the right person would come along and buy your you know, old bed frame or whatever it might be. But what technology is enabling us is to actually link those people together in real time using our mobile telephone. So for the, for the sprinkling of ladies in the audience who have party dresses that they wouldn't possibly wear after two or three occasions, you might be able to actually have access to an infinite wardrobe of free fashion through something like 99 Dresses, which allows you to upload dresses that you've worn once or twice in exchange for buttons, like a virtual currency, and then get a new dress from somebody else who's actually finished wearing this. You know, they've been to one wedding and they can't possibly be seen in it again. Uh, 99 Dresses actually allows women to cycle their fashion without having to fork out you know, for a new dress every time and actually see your dress being worn by somebody else. There was a tale, um, the, the founder, Nikki Durkin, of 99 Dresses, actually got her formal dress uh, through 99 Dresses and it actually ended up going to four or five formals throughout that entire year just by cycling through her friends, which is an amazing story. And as I said before, what this does is it enables us to have the efficiency to match millions of haves with millions of wants using technology but we're also being able to build trust between strangers online so that we know that when we send money to somebody, we're going to get a product in return. Or if we lend somebody our, our hedge trimmer, they're not going to break it. And this is, this is quite amazing phenomenon. And it's been supported by this mobile, social, and location-based technologies that are all enabling us to do this in, in real time. So we've moved from eBay and Craigslist and Gumtree, and now what we're seeing are sites like Yard Sale and a free website where you can actually, you know, you know, the stuff that gets left on the sidewalks, you actually take a photo and say that somebody's left their teddy bear on the corner, it's in perfectly good order, somebody else might want to go and pick it up. This real-time technology completely changes the game. That teddy bear was a bit questionable. <laughs> and the third system of collaborative consumption, which is my favourite, is collaborative lifestyles, because really the opportunities for what this, this creates in both our own lives and in the lives of others is amazing. If we're instead of just looking at stuff to swap, we can actually be capitalising on spare time, spare space, spare skills and even extra money that we might end up having in our back pockets. So the, the time that you have available on Friday afternoon, you can actually use doing, to do a task for somebody else on a site like Taskbox. The food that you have, the extra carrots could be swapped for somebody else's tomatoes. The money that you have in your wallet could actually be invested in something like Kickstarter to back a project. The space, your spare room, or for all those parents here whose kids are actually going to go elsewhere for college, you might want to rent out their rooms and make a bit of spare cash. 
and the skills that you have in coding or cooking or speaking French could actually be used to teach somebody else who's looking to apply new skills. It's enabling a whole new generation of what we call micropreneurs or micro-entrepreneurs, people who are thinking differently about what they want to do for their career, and rather than following a traditional path, they're actually thinking about what they really love to do, and these websites are enabling them to do that on a more full-time basis. So a site like Airbnb enables you to list your spare room, your spare apartment, or your whole house on this site, or in, in fact when you're travelling, you might actually want to stay in an apartment in Paris rather than stay in an expensive hotel in the of town. And the founder of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, says that Airbnb unlocks doors to parts of the city that visitors would otherwise not have access to, because you really get taken outside the tourist centres and you get to see the real neighbourhood, which is where the value is. A site like JRide actually matches people who are driving in a particular direction with somebody who, who needs a lift, basically. It's a ride-sharing platform to enable people to get from A to B who don't have their own car. And lastly, as I mentioned before, this is a very handy one that I used last week. Taskbox allows you to list a task and actually get somebody else who has you know, handyman skills or whatever the case might be to bid on that task and actually help you out for, for a bit of spare cash. And while you might be thinking that these sites are kind of getting us all online and we're becoming a bit automated and everything's happening digitally, what they're actually doing is enabling us to use the internet to actually get off the internet and engage in real life over shared interests and passions. So as we move away from this 20th century of hyper-consumption and the century of me, 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 and move towards this 21st century of collaborative consumption, an era of we, we're really going to start to see a big shift in the way we think about what and how we consume. And as the uh, New York Times journalist Mark Levine wrote in the early days of this movement, Sharing is to owning what the iPod is to the A-track, what solar power is to the coal mine. As young people, actually everybody in this room as this generation who's alive today, we really have the power to shift the way we think about consumption and to, to lose this value that we hold to individual ownership and high fences and, and blocking off our neighbours. And we can actually start to engage with what we have in a much easier way and actually not be burdened by the stuff we own. As it says in Bicon, things you own end up owning you. This is about liberating that, that opportunity. And I look forward to thinking about hearing young kids in the future talk about old school ownership and just what a retro idea it really is. <laughs> <laughs>